Brother Gene. Hey, how you doing, brother oh. Rick? <laughs> how are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day. So it's, I'm just counting blessings, you know. <laughs> That's great. Well, listen, you know, the only thing missing in that introduction is uh, that you're an insane musician. <laughs> and, uh, you know, probably, you know, not only one of the most talented CEOs, but definitely the most talented musician CEO that I know. Well, so, <laughs> <laughs> all right, Gene, I want to dig into this. There's a, there's a lot I want to cover. Um, you and I are, are, have been in constant contact for years, but especially since the pandemic started a year ago. I want you to take us back to this time last year when it became clear that we were dealing with something we had never dealt with before and you were going to be at the forefront of this war against the virus. Tell us, to take us back to last, you know, late March, early April. What was that like? Yeah, well, you know, and it it's almost feels like it was 10 years ago, uh, I think, uh, when I sent here. But actually, I started in back in, you know, it was declared in mid-March that, that we were in a, in a pandemic, but I was speaking to my colleagues around the country and, and hotspots that were already uh, seeing this. And in February, it was clear to me that this was going to be something bad. I actually called the, the county manager as she was looking at something. I said, this is, you know, we got to prepare for this. Um, it's coming. Um, and I just remember, Rick, sitting down with my team in our boardroom. We had our infectious disease doctors and, and some folks. And, I, and I, we just took a moment. And, and it was a gut check. <laughs> we knew that this was something that was going to be, I mean, when you start talking about pandemic, you know, uh, it, it's something we, we've, we've confronted and we really didn't quite know what it was. Um, I, I did have early on some of our doctors uh, uh, that had connections in China uh, be, uh, connect with their, with their colleagues in Wuhan. And so we were starting, even before we were starting to get data, like what it is, we knew masking was important <laughs> really before it kind of got traction, but it was, it was, you know, we were prepared. We were, we were, we were stealing ourselves you know, I, I, I put out a, a, a video to the team and I said, uh, we got this. But quite frankly, Rick, I had to convince myself that we had it first, you know. So every morning I was like, okay, I'm going to say we got this, but I, I need to believe in myself. As in, unfortunately, the, the team has done great. But it, it was, it was, you know, it's, it's something that's never, uh, you never experienced in your lifetime, especially being on the front line of this thing. Uh, well, the healthcare community has clearly been you know, one of the, the real heroes of this war. Um, tell us a little bit about your team and how they had to step up and, you know, how did that has, you know, how did your culture and, and all of that play a role on this? Yeah, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually wishing that we had uh, the high tech sweatpants that you guys just talked about. Uh, <laughs> I was I was upset that it's, that it's April Fool's because, you know, it's c connection and everything like that. Um, but, you know, I think it just people were tired. Um, I, re you know, if you think about just any of us that wear masks and for, for an hour or two, imagine uh, clinicians all throughout the hospital, right? They're donning this for eight to 12 hour shifts. They got the eyewear. If you need a, uh, some water, you have to take it off on and regown. So I think people are tired. Out. When I was rounding uh, just during the holidays, I, I just felt the set of exhaustion. Um, I was in one of our emergency rooms and there was a behavioral health patient that was getting combative. And so just the, in the middle of everything, when we're trying to figure out, do we have enough room to care for patients? You know, we have eight people in this room uh, trying to take care of this patient, but also, uh, so, so it's that kind of thing every mm. single day. Um, the, the, the couple of things that I've really focused on is just the 101 recognition. So the thing about Zoom, you can kind of zoom into different parts of the organization and say, thank you. I have a CEO coin that I give out that just, um, that I think uh, it's just my way of saying thank you. And, you know, maybe our generation, Rick, more so than e-cards, um, you know, I still have notes from people that I've gotten to say thank you in, in a drawer that I have. So, um, so I think this thank you was a lot. But the other thing we do that I think has been a bit of an antidote to what the exhaustion and burnout is, we call it connect the purpose. And so every single meeting that we have, every single meeting, whether it's a board finance meeting, board investment committee, we start off with a, a story of uh, how we're caring for the community, a patient or each other. And, you know, when you reconnect people with the why of what they do, um, mm -hmm. their purpose in a real authentic way, um, it, it just, it has a way of kind of re-energizing. And so we've had a lot of connected purposes, obviously during this pandemic. And I think that's been, we continue to tell stories to each other about the difference that, that we're making. And it has a way of lifting us up. 
Yeah, and just to give people some perspective, that's 70,000 employees is, you know, 1,500 care locations is four states, right? This is this is scaled up operations. So this is this must have really challenged you and your team. Yeah, it, it did. Because, you know, you're you're reinventing everything you do in the middle of it. We were, you know, as we we're trying to figure out how to do a field hospital. Right. And, and you, I think it was in the news. Everybody it was all over the country. Well, the challenge is FEMA only had certain resources to go to hotspots. So they were going to New York. We were trying to figure out how to set up a field hospital here in Charlotte. But we realized they, they just couldn't help us. So it would be we'd have to staff it. We'd have to find the PPE and take from our others. That we, yeah, so we're thinking, well, why set up another hospital? We've got to think about this differently. So I remember my team of clinicians says, we got an idea. Uh, we can take care of people at home. We got these sophisticated monitor systems. So we can, we got telehealth. We got medics that can go if they need an intervention. And literally in maybe, I think a week, and then uh, they said, hey, we need this amount of money. And then in two weeks, we had it up and running with our first patients. Um, and, you know, it just forced us to rethink and make decisions on the fly like that. We've cared for about 50,000 patients at home. Uh, if you would have told me in January, that was going to be something we're going <laughs> to said, absolutely not. That's ridiculous. Maybe in 10 years from now, and uh, it'll, we'll put it in our strategic plan and someday, and we were doing it, we made a decision in, in two weeks. So I think that's been the silver lining in it. We realized we were way too slow at making decisions before, and we, we, we've kind of speeded up our game. You know, I, I I remember you and I, you know, in the you know, like, you know, hustling for face masks, yes. hustling for equipment, hustling for things, and you know, the tell us about how the Charlotte community, the the leadership of the Charlotte community, came together in your mind. Yeah, you know, Rick, I've been in many uh, different states and, and throughout my career, thirty year career, and this is this is by far the best community in terms of how businesses work together with health systems, work together with the government. You know, it's, I'm not saying it's perfect, but I got to tell you, uh, you talk about masking, you know that the governor, uh, when, when, when he said, we're going to institute a, a masking mandate for North Carolina, and Gene, I need you if, uh, to be there on the stage with me as the largest provider. And remember back then, it was a lot of politics, you know, do you do it, do you not? And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm there with you. But then uh, that was going to be a Wednesday, and he asked me on Monday, and I called you, I called Brian Monihan's uh, Bank of America, I called the CEO of Lowe's, Marvin. I said, you know, I don't want to just go there on Wednesday, just saying we support it. I want to go with something. So uh, within literally, it's almost you know, 48 hours, we had commitments for a million masks. Um, and so there's, there's not many communities in the country that you can kind of have that relationship because, you know, the CEOs in this in this in this community, not only are work well together, but really civically minded. The way that you just started uh, uh, this, Rick, is just it's it's real. You're, you are and, and Red Ventures are just all the way in on this work, and so it's just it's just I, that's the thing I'm most proud of is just how these partnerships came together. Because I think it's not just for this moment. I think those partnerships and the relationships that we developed. You and I knew each other very well before this, but you know we become uh, best friends uh, during this, and 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 uh, and I think that's going to really help us solve some of the other tough things that we have ahead coming out of the pandemic. Uh, amen to that. Uh, let's talk about the current status of what's going on, right? You you have, you know, half the states I read this morning um, are tickling up. Um, you have vaccinations rolling out very aggressively at an, an, an unprecedented pace. It's, it's just great to see that part of America, you know, show up, right? And where, where you feel so proud of, of our might, if you may. You have the variants of which still unknown, more positive news as of late. Uh, in terms of what, how scary they may be. You have people that are exhausted and they just wanted to get out there. You have still so many unknowns. How long does the, the vaccines last and what, what are side effects and other things? What, what, what is your take on all of that? Um, specifically, um, you know, no one can predict anything here. I get that. But, but what, 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 is, what are things that you're telling your sister or your family or, you know, about all of this? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think um, one question I guess is sort of, are we going to be okay by summer? Because um, everybody wants to get back out there. Uh, I, 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 I say it's going to be better than last summer, but not quite as good as the summer before that. So <laughs> uh, that's the best I could do right now. Because, you know, uh, to your point, you know, they're, they're, it's rising in some areas. I think people are, are tired of it. It's, it's out and they're, they're, they're exhausted. 
uh, we're almost there. I mean, we are almost there. We got the vaccine. And, and so I think if we can hang in there for the next several months, it expedites our ability by the fall to kind of begin to feel like so, there's some return to whatever the new normal is. Because in some ways, I think this is, we've changed how we interact in, in this it's important ways that some of it will probably continue. But but that's the best. Uh, people want to hear, hey, what's the date that we can then, you know, kind of take everything off and be, uh, I said, you know, not. No uh, one knows. Uh, that nobody knows. Nobody knows. So are you vaccinated? I am. Yeah. Uh, I am. It, yeah. And uh, what what's your point of view on people that are debating, should they take the vaccine or not? You're, you're in the middle of all the science and you're in the middle of, you know, all of this. So what's your point of view? Yeah, I mean, I know that I know the the sense out there is, hey, it, it came through really fast, um, and is there any issues with that? And, and no, I mean, not only do I listen, obviously, to the to the, to the CDC, we got direct access to NIH, but obviously, I got I got some really uh, nationally known uh, infection disease specialists on on, on the um, on my on my team, and and it, and it is safe. And the the more data that's coming out, you're realizing it's even safer than what we thought it was. So I think I think that's not that's not the issue. The one thing I I am um, I've, I've shifted my conversation though, and it actually came from the Senate hearing that I recently did. One of the panelists said it's not about don't call it vaccine hesitancy because that kind of blames the person, right? It's like you're hesitant. Um, you know, call it vaccine readiness. You know, some people are a different stage of, of readiness, and so and, and you know, like we do market segmentation, you've got to really think about well, why is somebody not yet ready? Well, if you're millennial or, or in the process of getting it, convenience may be an issue. Um, if you, you know, if you're uh, African-American or person of color, you're still thinking about the Tuskegee and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, research that, that really uh, on, on syphilis on, on, on black men that it was still going on in the 70s. So this is not just way, way long ago. If, if, so we, we really have, if you're an anti-masker, you might be an anti-vaxxer. And so I think if we're going to, we need, we need to all do this together because we need herd immunity, but I think we have to be much more market segmented in terms of how we explain to people, you know, why, what, how they can be ready. And the 101 on this is what we found is that if somebody looks like you, uh, as in your social circles, that's gotten one, they're probably the best person to convince you to, to do it. Um, and, uh, but bottom line is it is safe. I wouldn't have gotten it if safe. I wouldn't have asked, told my mom to get it if it was safe, family members. Uh, I'm trying to get everybody safe. My, my kids are a little bit uh, too young to get it yet, but it's, it's lining up. So, so I would say 100% get the vaccine. Uh, it is coming from, from, from me who's already had it and has access to the latest science. You, you, you touched upon um, kind of the race issue in healthcare, and I think this pandemic for sure has brought to light uh, to many of us who were not as aware the the health inequities that exists in in society in our communities. Um, what's your take on on in, on what's going on, and, and what can be done out of the pandemic for us to kind of shorten that gap that exists today in, in healthcare? Yeah. Well, you know, again, the way that you started, Rick, uh, you know, we're in the trial for, for George Floyd's murder. Um, what I say is on the day that George Floyd died, was killed, um, there's about probably 200,000, uh, I'm sorry, about 2,000 people that died of social determinants of health, uh, structural inequities, poverty, mm -hmm. uh, on the same day. It's not on television. So, so, but what happened during uh, the pandemic is what we realized that was on television. You, we would see that uh, black and brown people were dying at six times the rate of, of the majority population. Um, and, and people act surprised like, why? Well, this is something we've known for, for it's just it's not been on television and we didn't have a pandemic to really to bring it out. Our, our key focus was, and early on, we have, we have uh, this geo mapping data system. So we mm -hmm. actually knew exactly what uh, neighborhoods, this was back in late March, uh, there was testing disparities, what neighborhoods were, were, were you know, um, had what the median income. And so we were able to pinpoint pretty early on uh, what, where we needed to take our roving bands. So we have bands that are like, a, you know, a medical office on wheels. We were able to go into those communities directly. The only way that we were able to do that really and get as deep in the community is by working with, with, the, with the faith community and community leaders. And mm -hmm. so we had those relationships before the pandemic. I think I would say, and I met with uh, uh, Village Heartbeat, which is a, is a group of, of 60 different uh, churches. I met with their board of directors on Monday. And, and, and one of the things they said, which made me feel good is in the middle of this, uh, we didn't call 
you, you called us asking if, 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 if we needed help. And when I told them, it's because we knew what the neighborhoods were. So we knew what churches needed to do. And so that partnership, that ability to, to, uh, to work deep into the community is something that I think uh, the whole world has been reminded of. And, um, and if you look at our roving band, 75% of the people that we're vaccinating now are people of color. Um, and we've done about 9,000 shots in these communities. We're going to continue to double up our efforts. So, so the, 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 the thing for me is uh, this can't just be our efforts during the pandemic. If we stop, you know, when, when we get back to normal, quote unquote, whatever that is, um, then we've lost this opportunity and there's going to be another George Floyd in, in two years and, and we're going to kind of be in a mess. I think we have a window here to really do something systemic, to deal with the systemic issues that, that are out there in a systemic and thoughtful way. Mm. And that keeps me up at night um, because I, I see, you know, I see the window shrinking unless we continue to, to lean in in a pretty heavy way. What, what, um, actually, let's come back to this. I want to, I want to go back to, you touched on, um, you know, some of the concerns around vaccine was like how quickly some of these vaccines were developed, especially the ones under kind of newer technologies like mRNA. Right. I read something recently that, that shocked me, Gene, it was the, the actual development of the Pfizer vaccine mm-hmm. was six weeks. Right. All the testing was nine months and all the things that you need to go yeah. through the, the typical trials to make sure it's safe. But, you know, the algorithms, the data sets, the ability to take the, the DNA of the virus and then figure out a way what will effectively kind of attack the virus took six weeks. Right. And that just blows my mind. Right. That that with computers, with algorithms, with machine learning, uh, I think we're at the dawn of something remarkable that come out that will come out of all the discoveries we're making. You're talking about how you're able to deliver and make decisions so much faster. There are so many orphan diseases that no one is funding that I'm sure as a healthcare provider dri- drives you crazy, right? Because, you know, there, there's the, the way that the, the system works, no one is funding them. What do you hope comes out of you know, almost like um, a renaissance of, of you know, in, in this particular case of, of drugs that will, you know, kind of you know, really be one of the silver linings of all of this. Yeah, that's so well framed, Rick. I, I mean, I think um, the, the, these vaccines were developed with scientists sharing knowledge from around the world. I think that's the, you know, we have these companies, but they're, they're relying on science that's happened all over the world. And while the politics was going on and all the, the noise that was going on, the scientists were behind sharing information, sharing data, you know, that's that, you know, I know our countries are at, at war and fighting, but this is, this is what we are learning. I'm hoping that those relationships uh, uh, continue to, to develop. And when you've got, you know, one major pharma company agreeing to, to manufacture. Uh, That's from crazy. Another, like, <laughs> how did that happen? Like, how did Merck that happen? and J&J working together. That's how I, I, mean, I mean, that is, that is just, uh, I would have taken a thousand dollar bet times 20, you know, bet to say, could that ever happen? Never in my lifetime. So, so I think you see these companies working together that, that's the infrastructure and that's the relationship we need to, to, to do what you're exactly what you're saying to say, okay, how about the three of us work together and, and really put money into this, uh, sp- split the overhead costs. But the other, other part I would say, like a Pfizer, it's not just the, the time it took to do the, vac- the vaccine, but also the scale up that was required. So they have these mm-hmm. whole, rather than building these new warehouses or, and the things that they, they were doing, you know, they were prefabbing stuff to cut the time in, in, in you know, because uh, they needed the speed. So I think the hope we're going to go back and, and learn from this and say, what took us so long? And, and let's not wait for another pandemic to mm. be able to deal with the latest cancer drugs, how, how to deal with, with, with diabetes, kidney disease, Alzheimer's, dementia, all of that. I think it's, it's really reframed uh, how we think about the ability to, to put that in people's arms uh, uh, quickly. You know, I think it's the combination of kind of the, 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 the age of technology and where we are from a computational power, um, you know, in, in AI combined with changing the processes exactly. that can lead to this renaissance um, in, in, in the discovery of so many things that, uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I wanna, I, I'm super excited about this. And I, I, I think three, five, 10 years from now, we're gonna be talking about things that happen as a result of this. Well, yeah. I, wanna, I wanna pivot to a little bit of the healthcare industry in general. 
You know, yeah. I know that close to 20% of GDP today is healthcare. And, you know, from the outside looking in, it seems like a runaway freight train, right? It just seems like it continues to grow and grow and grow. Um, you know, if you study the industry a little bit, so we, we own a big healthcare business in Healthline and, and we have lots of different kind of, you know, go to market, you know, relationships, you can see that the, the incentive system is not aligned uh, with, with kind of basics of economics, right? The, the, the people that are spending the, the, the dollars are not the ones accountable for the dollars. And then, then you have all this other kind of almost trapped value in the system that, that what, what do you hope? happens in the healthcare industry in the next 10 years, right? Um, at your retirement party, we're going to have a big one. Uh, what do you hope healthcare looks like that is different than today? Yeah. You know, it, this is not a system that you would design uh, this way if you started by scratch. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's it's the it's all the things that you know what we learned is is convenience is, is we uh, Americans love convenience you know uh, what how we define a weight um, versus how some European uh, uh, my mother's from southern Spain def define weight is completely different you know um, we don't want to sit for a three hour four hour meal we want to sit for 15 minutes and then go do what we're going to do. <laughs> So I think this idea of convenience has really seeped into to healthcare too. So I think healthcare will continue to be, you know, as easy, fast, where, where, where you're at uh, delivery. And then obviously cost um, is affordability. We, we really have to change the equation on that. Uh, this may sound like a little bit of a defensive uh, uh, comment because of where I sit as, as managing one of the larger houses in the country. But if, you know, this is a multifactorial issue because, you know, we, the hospitals are the ones that give you the bill. So you say, wow, this is a big bill and I don't quite understand it. We're trying to get better at that. But mm -hmm. if you look at how we get paid, uh, so 60% uh, of our uh, revenue comes from Medicare or Medicaid. We don't set the price for that, uh, right? 10% uh, comes from uh, people that can't pay, um, 10, 11%. So, so then you got 70% of, of what we're delivering care for um, we don't we don't control pricing and, and quite frankly a lot of that we're upside down. Then we got the 30% that's typically you know commercial insurance that we're not covering the cost of inflation. And so so we are we have to be part of the solution in the health system, but it's pharma, it's supply, it's regulation, it's businesses, it's a whole complex equation. Uh, but those are the two things I think we between now and 10 years, we've got to really solve the the the, the cost equation. Um, and it's probably going to take uh, that long to get to a place where we feel comfortable and the convenience, I think, is just going to be the way that, that we deliver care. Telehealth is a great example. We went from 1,300 uh, telehealth visits before the pandemic to 130,000. Just um, and, and so it kind of gives you a sense that and that's back down probably to 60 to 70,000 a month. But it's, it's the way that care is going to be delivered in a convenient way in your home, even behavioral health. You know, uh, right. we're delivering a lot of behavioral health through through this tele uh, health infrastructure. I think it's just going to be a new way of doing things. Yeah, and, and I think I think the telehealth can help with the health inequities because transportation and, and, and all of those things can be addressed differently with the right education, the right access into the community. And, and maybe a lot of those systems that have been put in place or relationships can be tapped much further, you know, you were talking about the, the, the church leaders and so forth. Yeah, great. Uh, very exciting. Uh, let, let's, um, you know, a couple more questions and I, I know you gotta go. So as a, as a CEO of color, yeah. you know, someone that um, represents a lot more than just healthcare, but, you know, a community that has been, you know, in, in, in many ways, you know, if, if you think about the responsibilities that you have as a leader, um, you know, you stand for a lot more than just healthcare. You, you, you represent, um, you know, a, a segment of the population that has been pushed aside. Uh, what have you learned through the George Floyd uh, crisis and, and how is your perspective different from, you know, kind of your seat and what you need to be doing? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think the one thing is, uh, Rick, actually, you know, I've had people sometimes see, you know, uh, your CEO and you may have had a different path uh, than others, you know, and, and I know what it was growing up, you know, we, we had food, we had all the things that we needed, but I know it was to worry about light bills and, you know, and all that kind of stuff uh, uh, growing up. Um, so, but, but one of the things I think it's been for me is after George Floyd, 
was killed. Um, I, I've not been a CEO or person that really have shared my own personal experience. Um, mm -hmm. Had a lot of cour courageous conversation, you know. Um, but I remember a, a couple of my teammates saying, you know, for people to feel comfortable saying exactly what's on their mind and, and the pain that they're feeling, you're going to have to share from, you have to be in a vulnerable spot and share your own experiences. So, you know, I, I, I began to share my experiences, which, you know, initially was a, a, not that uncomfortable to share, but I, I just had this vision that, or this image that CEOs shouldn't necessarily share their own little personal issues that's about everybody else. Um, you know, so I, I shared when I was 20 and I was in South Carolina getting pulled over by the, by the police and, and having canines and, and all of that and feeling just completely fundamentally disrespected. And, and, and you know, uh, so I, I, would, I would share stories. I think that's really, I've had to tell really a little bit of my experience. I think that's opened up uh, the, the, the conversation. The other thing is, it's just been extraordinarily personal to me because uh, people that have been dying could be members of my own family, but it's not just personal to me. It's the same thing what I value about Red Ventures and, which, and the leadership you're bringing, the culture that you've got is it's, it's not a, you know, we have a, we, we say we're gonna improve health, elevate hope and advance healing for all. The for all part of it is really what people gravitate to. So it's not just me, feeling personal, actually that's 70,000 people, you know, people are taking it personal. Uh, you know, uh, White Coats for Black Lives, I've got my doctors and, and, and things of that nature. So it's just, um, it, it's, it's been a galvanizing cry. It, it's for the organization. It's made those health, hope and healing words really mean something for all. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's, it's been this weird thing is what you said. It, it's, it's, there's just been devastation and trauma but then there's there's energy and excitement that we can do something. I when I spoke at the, uh, the Senate committee, I said my main thing was this was I didn't want to look back um, and say I wish I would have done something differently for for the people that were vulnerable. And we said not on our watch. I said we need to collectively take the ingenuity um, that got Neil Armstrong on the moon in less than ten years, right. and then say between now and 2030, not on our watch. Just right. not, let's take the same ingenuity. Let's take the same level of collaboration. We are Americans. Th th that's the spirit that I I'd like to continue to, to partner with. I, I know you and I will continue to partner and others to say, not on our watch. We're not going to let this happen on our watch. And, right. and we have, a, I, I think that's what, that there is some energy and, and, um, and commitment and, and, and connection to purpose uh, just in, 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 in this time that I think I've discovered in a, in a, but in a much more visceral way. So much, so much there that, that makes a lot of sense, you know, so well said, you know, if you think about it, you, you touched on vulnerability as a, as a leadership trait being something that we all have been forced to, uh, to, you know, grow into and, and how that has not only made us perhaps more relatable, but more importantly has made others open up and the more we can bring ourselves to work, the more this really connects us as humans and as a community. But I think your second point is, is really perhaps to me one of the, the big takeaways from the pandemic. And I, I had a bit of this realization as I reflected on what was an exhausting year for, for, many, for, for many reasons and for all of us. And it was like, you know what, at the end of the day, you know, the only reason we need to focus on growth and continue to do great as a business is so that we can be a, a good force in our community. And it starts with our employees, but it also bleeds into the community. And that's really the whole reason why this exists. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it took the pandemic for me to get clarity on that. And it's exactly what you're saying. So last question for you. Um, I know that you're a proud father to amazing young men. Uh, one of them I got to know very well. You're a rock star musician. You sit in the Federal Reserve. You sit in Best Buy sports. Like, you know, what? what what advice do you have other people who want to grow up to be like Gene Woods? Uh, uh, what does it take? I was going to follow your path. Um, uh, I, I tell you, there's, there's, you know, there's a couple of practices that, that uh, you have to stay consistent with. For me, the grounding practice, I just had a meditation practice for 30 years. And I take every morning, just take about 15 minutes and just try to quiet myself. Because I think when you get in the, in the heat of the day, 
you, you have a tendency you can react to things. So, so that's been that's been one of the things that has grounded me uh, as I go through. But you mentioned music; it's about bringing your whole self to work. I was not going to, you know, I used to keep music on this side and professional music, uh, professional <laughs> side on this side. And and this year, the, again, the, the teammates said, "Hey, we, you you can play music. We want you to play for everybody." And so I think find some, find find something that brings you joy. And and uh, I think uh, I think that can go a long ways to, to, to having you realize, you know, your full potential. You know, we should do a, now that we have this virtual world, we should do a joint talent show where we have people from you guys and us and do kind of a talent show, maybe find, a, you know, something that we both care deeply about and, uh, and do something like that. We like that. Fun to bring yeah. our raise, raise money for some big yeah, cause. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'd, I'd, I'd love to do that. Yeah. Listen, I know we're a little bit over time. Um, much appreciation. I have a ton of respect for you as a, as a professional, but more even so as a human being. And I, I count you as a dear friend and, and grateful for that and grateful for your time today. So thanks, Gene. Muchas gracias, amigo. Un abrazo. Cuídate. Bye.